Welcome, 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 everyone. Uh, welcome to Great Bay Community College uh, and to today's session. Uh, this marks the first installment this semester for Great Bay's Perspectives on, Communi on Community Colloquium, which aims to provide a space for diverse voices on matters relevant to our students and the greater community. More info on the colloquium can be found at greatbay.edu backslash perspectives on community colloquium backslash uh, with dashes between the words or by simply Googling perspectives on community colloquium. Our speaker today is Melina Hill Walker, program director at the Endowment for Health, where she manages a portfolio of grants, projects and policy initiatives to advance health equity. Prior to her appointment at the endowment, Melina has extensive experience in New Hampshire healthcare and reform from her work as a project coordinator, a grant manager, and a researcher at the Aging Resource Center at the Dartmouth Centers for Health and Aging, a visiting nurse and hospice of Vermont and New Hampshire, the Geisel School of Medicine of Dartmouth, and Melina has also served as a senior community health planner in New York City, worked in the Democratic Republic of Congo as a public health volunteer and a program assistant, and ran an independent healthcare consultancy. Melina holds a Master of Studies, a Master of Science, excuse me, in Health Policy and Management from the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and a Bachelor of Arts in English and American Literature from Brown University. She has also served in volunteer and board roles for several academic and nonprofit organizations, including Dartmouth Hitchcock and the Upper Valley Ho uh, Hostel. Today, she will be speaking to us about access to healthcare and policy in the midst of pandemic. A couple of things before we begin. To better facilitate our speaker's remarks, we will be keeping the audience muted throughout most of the session. And we ask that any questions that you have be sent via the chat function to the host moderators, and we will pass them on to our guests after they complete their remarks. However, at certain points, uh, there will be open questions during which you may either respond verbally or by unmuting through the chat function. There will also be an opportunity to ask follow-up questions by unmuting or sending the follow-up uh, follow through the chat after your question has been addressed. Feel free, of course, to tender your questions at any time throughout the session. I'd also like to remind everyone that the session is being recorded for the benefit of the college community and those who cannot attend live. If you would prefer not to be recorded, you may turn off your device camera and remain muted during the session. With that, I thank you very much again uh, to our colloquium, to our session here today, and I turn it over to Melina Hill Walker. Well, hello all. Uh, thank you, Emma and Jordan, for the opportunity to offer this presentation today on the topics of race, intersectionality, and New Hampshire within the context of health and wellness. As a public health professional and someone who grew up in New Hampshire, I'm honored to work at the Endowment for Health, New Hampshire's largest health foundation. In this time of global pandemic and racial reckoning, it's important to take time to examine the issues of race and intersectionality, particularly within the context of health and wellness. Prior to beginning my presentation today, I feel the need to acknowledge the extremely grim and staggering milestone our country hit yesterday. 500,000, half a million deaths due to COVID-19, 1,154 of which were deaths of New Hampshire residents. It was just over 12 months ago that the first COVID-19 cases were being diagnosed in our country. The first US COVID death occurred in February, 2020. Just prior to that time, in late January, 2020, before our state's residents had fully grasped what might happen in our country, I was concerned for my daughter's health and safety in Shanghai, China. She had returned to China in late January to celebrate Chinese New Year with friends after teaching for two years in, southern mainland, in the southern mainland city of Shenzhen, about 45 minute train ride from Hong Kong. Her visits to friends within China didn't last very long. She spent 10 days apartment bound before luckily catching a series of flights back to the US, which wasn't a given at the time. In early February last year, I was under quarantine in my New Hampshire home 
for 14 days along with my daughter. My family has been very fortunate health-wise to date, but this sadly hasn't been the case for so many people in our nation and our state. More than 73,000 New Hampshireites have contracted the disease to date. This global pandemic has disproportionately affected people and communities of color in our state and nation. During my presentation today, I'll provide definitions for a number of terms and concepts, including race, intersectionality, diversity, health disparity, equality, equity, and inequity. I'll also share information about the endowment funded race and equity New Hampshire series and some of the many New Hampshire organizations and efforts addressing race and equity issues in the Granite State. I'm now gonna share screen and pull up my PowerPoint. Oh, where's my PowerPoint? Can you see that? Jordan, yeah, good, we're good. Okay, great, all right. So uh, I'd like to start by talking about the social construct called race. These 10 statements about the social construct called race come from California Newsreel's 2003 three-part documentary series, Race, the Power of an Illusion. This is their list of the 10 things everyone should know about race. As they state, our eyes tell us that people look different. No one has trouble distinguishing, say, a Czech from a Chinese. But what do those differences mean? Are they biological? Has race always been with us? How does race affect people today? There's less and more to race than meets the eye. Number one, race is a modern idea. Ancient societies like the Greeks did not divide people according to physical distinctions but according to religion, status, class, even language. The English language didn't even have the word for race until it turns up in 1508 in a poem by William Dunbar referring to a line of kings. Number two, race has no genetic basis. Not one characteristic, trait, or even one gene distinguishes all the members of one so-called race from all the members of another so-called race. Number three, Human subspecies don't exist. Unlike many animals, modern humans simply haven't been around long enough or isolated enough to evolve into separate subspecies or races. Despite surface appearances, we are one of the most similar of all species. Number four, skin color really is only skin deep. Most traits are inherited independently from one another. The genes influencing skin color have nothing to do with the genes influencing hair form, eye shape, blood type, musical talent, athletic ability, or forms of intelligence. Knowing someone's skin color doesn't necessarily tell you, tell you anything about them. Number five, most variation is within, not between so-called races. Of the small amount of total human variation, 85% exists within any local population be they Italians, Kurds, Koreans, or Cherokees. About 94% can be found within any continent. That means two random Koreans may be as genetically different as a Korean and an Italian. Number six, slavery predates race. Throughout much of human history, societies have enslaved others, often as a result of conquest or war, even debt, but not because of physical characteristics or a belief in natural inferiority. Due to a unique set of historical circumstances, ours, the United States, was the first slave system where all the slaves shared similar physical characteristics. Number seven, race and freedom evolved together. The US was founded on the radical new principle that quote, all men are created equal, unquote but our early economy was based largely on slavery. How could this anomaly be rationalized? The new idea of race helped explain why some people could be denied the rights and freedoms that others took for granted. Number eight, race justified social inequalities as natural. As the race idea evolved, 
white superiority became the accepted belief in the majority population, shall we say, almost common sense in America. It justified not only slavery, but also the extermination of the Native Americans, exclusion of Asian immigrants, and the taking of Mexican lands by a nation that professed a belief in democracy. Racial practices were institutionalized within American government, laws, and society. This speaks to the systemic racism, racism that is ubiquitous throughout this country on so many levels, and yet invisible to those who aren't directly impacted by it. Race isn't biological, but racism is still real. Race is a powerful social idea that gives people different access to opportunities and resources. Our government and social institutions have created advantages that disproportionately channel wealth, power, and resources to white people. This affects everyone, whether we are aware of it or not. Number 10, color blindness will not end racism. Pretending race doesn't exist is not the same as creating equality. Race is more than stereotypes and individual prejudice. To combat racism, we need to identify and remedy social policies and institutional practices that advantage some groups at the expense of others. Each of the 10 statements are important. Today, I'd like us to especially keep in mind three of them. Number two, race has no genetic basis. Number three, race isn't biological, but racism is real. And number 10, color blindness will not end racism. Now I'll play a short video for you from California Newsreel that underscores the biological illusion of race. question that individual human beings are different, one from the other. Our eyes confirm this day in and day out. Skin color, body shape, hair form, eye shape, 100 years. We have used these visual differences to classify people into four or five groups we call races. We have a notion of race as being divisions among people that are deep, that are essential, that are somehow biological or even genetic, and that are unchanging, that these are clear-cut, distinct categories of people. And the beauty of the race business is that you can identify people by just looking at them. You don't even have to look at their genes because one manifestation of their genes is there, namely skin color or eye shape or hair shape. And then that's the key to everything. The idea of race assumes that simple external differences rooted in biology are linked to other more complex internal differences, like athletic ability, musical aptitude, intelligence. This belief is based on the idea that race is biologically real. All of our genetics now is telling us that that's not the case. We can't find any genetic markers that are in everybody of a particular race and in nobody of some other race. We can't find any genetic markers that define race. And actually, what we're going to generate are billions of copies of a little section of your, of your genetic code. 
These students are gathering for a DNA workshop led by Cold Spring Harbor Labs teacher Scott Bronson. Marcus, Gorgeous, Jackie, Noah, Hannah, Jamil, and their fellow students are about to explore the biology of human variation. But there's another type of DNA. Does anybody know what that type of DNA is? Yeah. Mitochondrial? Mitochondrial DNA. Very good. They will compare their skin colors. They're like not human colors. <laughs> they will type their blood. And they will swab cells from inside their mouths to extract a small portion of their own DNA. Once the sample is ready, they will compare some of their genetic similarities and differences. We're going to look at a very tiny section of this ring. We're just going to look at the students begin the workshop with the same assumptions most of us have. As you begin to look at the data, you might want to keep in your mind who you think you might be most similar to and who you think you might be most different to. I think I probably have the most similarities with uh, Mr. Bronson or with Carol because we were white males, both Carol and I and both Scott Bronson and I. I think I'd have the most differences with Carol and the most similarities with Gorgeous. She's African American, I'm African American. I mean, like, black. I think maybe me and Natalia are most alike. She's Latin American and I'm Latin American. I figured that there would be tons of differences, especially with people who looked so different. To understand why the idea of race is a biological myth requires a major paradigm shift, an absolute paradigm shift, a shift in perspective. And for me, it's like seeing you know, what it must have been like to understand that the world isn't flat. And perhaps I can invite you to a mountaintop and you can look out the window and at the horizon and see, oh, what I thought was flat, I can see a curve in now that the world is much more complicated. In fact, that race is not based on biology, but race is rather an idea that we ascribe to biology. Okay, so um, before we move on to our next slide about intersectionality, I'd like us to keep in mind the comment made by biological anthropologist, Alan Goodman just now, that to understand why the idea of race is a biological myth requires a major paradigm shift, an absolute paradigm shift, a shift in perspective. It must have been like to understand that the world isn't flat, that in fact, race is not based on biology, but is rather an idea that we ascribe to biology. While race is a social construct, an idea ascribed to biology, in our society, there are major ramifications that continue to exist today for people with darker skin tone, particularly people of African descent. As statement eight reads, race justified social inequalities as natural. And we see these inequalities and inequities present in the country and New Hampshire today, highlighted most significantly today by the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 in communities of color. Oops. So, the term I'd like to, um, the American, what is intersectionality? American civil rights advocate and law professor, Kimberly Crenshaw coined this term, which speaks specifically to the impact of overlapping identities and the interconnected nature of social categorizations, such as race, class, and gender, as they apply to a given individual or group and understood to create overlapping and independent systems of discrimination or disadvantage. In a more general sense, intersectionality is about understanding and addressing potential roadblocks to an individual's or groups well-being, and the theory is now applied across a range of social divisions. This video illustrates the term. Oops. 
sorry, excuse me. I'm going to try that again. What is intersectionality? Intersectionality is a way of understanding social relations by examining intersecting forms of discrimination. This means acknowledging that social systems are complicated and that many forms of oppression, like racism, sexism and ageism, might be present and active at the same time in a person's life. Everyday approaches to building equality tend to focus on one type of discrimination, for instance sexism, and then work to address only that specific concern. But while the career of a young, white and able-bodied woman might improve with gender equality protections, an older, black, disabled lesbian may continue to be hampered by racism, ageism, ableism and homophobia in the workplace. Intersectionality is about understanding and addressing all potential roadblocks to an individual or group's well-being. But it's not as simple as just adding up oppressions and addressing each one individually. Racism, sexism and ableism exist on their own, but when combined, they compound and transform the experience of oppression. Intersectionality acknowledges that unique oppressions exist, but is also dedicated to understanding how they change in combination. The roots of intersectionality lie within the black feminist movement, with legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw originating the term. Crenshaw felt that anti-racist and feminist movements were both overlooking the unique challenges faced by black women. She stated that legislation about race is framed to protect black men, and legislation about sexism is understood to protect white women. So simply combining racism and sexism together does not therefore protect black women. Intersectional theory is now applied across a range of social divisions and also to understandings of domination, such as those associated with whiteness, masculinity and heterosexuality. Intersectionality is not only about multiple identities and it's not a simple answer to solving problems around equality and diversity. It is, however, an essential framework as we truly engage with issues around privilege and power and work to bring them into the open. Intersectionality means listening to others, examining our own privileges and asking questions about who may be excluded or adversely affected by our work. As importantly, it means taking measurable action to invite, include and centre the voices and work of marginalised individuals. Okay, so I'd also like to share another short video in which Professor Crenshaw herself speaks about intersectionality in relation to schools and learning, given the academic audience I'm speaking to today. Intersectionality is just a metaphor for understanding the ways that multiple forms of inequality or disadvantage sometimes compound themselves and they create obstacles that often are not understood within conventional ways of thinking about anti-racism or feminism or whatever social justice advocacy structures we have. Intersectionality isn't so much a grand theory, it's a prism for understanding certain kinds of problems. African-American girls are six times more likely to be suspended than white girls. That's probably a race and a gender problem. It's not just a race problem, it's not, not just a gender problem. So I encourage people to think about how the convergence of race stereotypes or gender stereotypes might actually play out in the classroom between teachers and students, between students and other students between students and administrators and commit themselves to understanding that as a way of intervening and providing equal educational opportunity for all students regardless of their identities. Identity isn't simply a self-contained unit, it is a relationship between
between people in history, people in communities, people in institutions. So schools do a good job when they understand that and when they commit themselves to curricular development, to opportunities in the school, for all students to understand the histories that have brought us to this particular moment. You can't change outcomes without understanding how they've come about. So independent schools can take the lead on that to be responsive to their student populations and to the communities out of which the students come. Okay, thank you, Professor Crenshaw. And as Professor Crenshaw notes, intersectionality is just a metaphor for understanding the ways that multiple forms of inequality or disadvantage sometimes compound themselves. We'll see later how different social sectors impact health and well being, and why it's important to keep in mind this metaphor of intersectionality for how it plays out and impacts different groups of people based on the social construct of race. This wordle presents an opportunity for each of us to consider what diversity means to us and how we perceive it in our New Hampshire communities. Does it mean speaking a language other than English in the home as documented in significant numbers of households in our state's Northern Coas County? Does it speak to a need for greater humanity, greater togetherness, a variety of ethnicities or perceived races? What does diversity mean to you? These questions are important as we look at the growing racial and ethnic diversity in the Granite State. New Hampshire's demographics are changing. It's important to understand these demographic changes and implications for all our residents. Given statement number eight, Erase the Power of an Illusion, race justified social inequalities as natural. Racial practices were institutionalized within American government, laws, and society that led to systemic racism, which is ubiquitous throughout this country on so many levels including in New Hampshire, and yet invisible to those who aren't directly impacted by it. The map on the left is the percent minority overall in New Hampshire in 2010, or the racial and ethnic diversity for the entire population in 2010. The map on the right is the percent minority under age 18 for the same year. The light blue is under 5% of the population. The darker green is five to 10% of the population. These maps show how racial and ethnic diversity is increasing most quickly in our youth and where that diversity is concentrated. While apparently more concentrated in our state's southern tier, it's really growing across the state. Here is more recent demographic data for New Hampshire from 2018, eight years later than the previous slide, showing in the pie chart on the left, the increased percentage of youth of color children under age 18 in New Hampshire at 15.5% compared to the pie chart on the right showing adults of color in New Hampshire at 8.7%. The future population of our state will be far more racially and ethnically diverse than it has been in the past. When we consider our state's changing demographics and the implications of statement eight in race, the power of an illusion, it's important to look at whether disparities exist in different sectors between racial and ethnic groups in our state. To the endowment for health, this information is of major importance. What do we mean therefore by health disparities? There are several definitions for health disparities, including this definition from the US Health and Human Services Plan. The key part of this definition to remember is the first sentence. A health disparity is a particular type of health difference that is closely linked to social, economic, and or environmental disadvantage. So are there health disparities in New Hampshire? Well, unfortunately, there are. As we will see later, education and employment are socioeconomic factors that impact 40% of an individual and a population's overall health. These factors form part of the social determinants of health. This slide shows the intersectionality of education and employment with overall health. In New Hampshire, as shown by the image on the left, just 69% of adults with some high school education report good or better health versus 95% of college graduates. 
In the image on the right, only 59% of adults with income of 15,000 or lower report good health, compared to 90%, 95% of adults earning 50,000 or more. This graphic shows the correlation between wealth and longevity and between socioeconomic status and mortality. Overall, we can note that greater education leads to higher income, higher reported good health, and lower mortality. So what is equity? Now we've discussed diversity and disparities. Let's take a look at two terms that are often confused, equality and equity. This graphic created by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation provides a good visual to understand the difference. In the top row, we see that everyone gets the same thing, a bicycle. However, only one of the people is able to actually use the bicycle. In the bottom row, we see that everyone gets what they need, a bicycle that fits and works for them. Therefore, equity is not just equality. It is that everyone has equality of opportunity. So what is inequity? Is there an equity in New Hampshire? Before we give some examples, let's first define inequity. What's important to understand is that inequities are socially produced, potentially avoidable, unjust, and unfair. So to address inequity, we must see people within the context of their community. While access to and the quality of healthcare obtained are key ingredients to good health, it's important to appreciate that there's much more that affects our overall health. This graphic is related to historically underrepresented race and ethnic group experiences here in New Hampshire, and is taken from a 46 page report called Health and Equity in New Hampshire 2013 report card. On the left, you see the cardiovascular rates for white women in New Hampshire at 1.8%, compared with that of minority women in New Hampshire, at 5.7%, a disparity score of 3.2. Regarding a lack of health insurance coverage, we see that 15.4% of white men in New Hampshire lack coverage, compared with 38.5% of minority men. The New Hampshire Center for Public Policy Studies wrote this report, which points to many more health disparities. We see that inequities in health have existed in New Hampshire well before COVID-19 came to our state. Data since the pandemic, pandemic hit New Hampshire have highlighted how stark these inequities are in a variety of social sectors, which have an impact on health, similar to the graphics shown previously regarding education and income. The disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on communities of color in New Hampshire led Governor Sununu to write an executive order in May 2020 to create the governor's COVID-19 equity response team. Members of the team included Bobby Bagley, Kirsten Dersey, Rogers Johnson, Dottie Morris, and Sunidad and former director of the Office of Health Equity at the New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services, Trinidad Tellez, who chaired the response team. Sadly, Rogers Johnson, passed away five months later in November of 2020. This table comes from the governor's COVID-19 equity response team's report and highlights the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on people of color in New Hampshire. While black or African-Americans make up only 1.4% of the population, they made up 5.4% of COVID cases. Similarly, while Hispanic Latino residents make up only 3.9% of the New Hampshire population, they made up 6.1% of COVID-19 cases at the time the report was submitted to the governor on July 12, 2020. By contrast, white residents make up 90% of the population, but made up only 81% of COVID-19 cases. Here's another date, a set of data from the COVID-19 Interactive Equity Dashboard. Latinos account for only 7% of those cases and African-Americans for 5.6%. While as a pop percentage of the population, New Hampshire is 3.9% Latino 
and 1.4% Black. It's important to note as well that Black and Latino residents are more likely to be essential workers. The governor's COVID-19 equity response team's July 12th report provided 11 strategic pillars and 64 recommendations to address the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 in communities of color. It focused on immediate, short, and long-term strategies. For example, to address systemic policy changes, Pillar 11, policy, proposed the establishment of a policy committee of the codified equity response team. The response team's report also included this public health framework from the Bay Area Regional Health Inequities Initiative for reducing health inequities. It recognized to the bottom left, the upstream implications, social and institutional inequities and living conditions, and the downstream implications, bottom right, risk behaviors, disease and injury, injury leading to mortality for a population's health. You will see how many of these implications directly impact health in the next slide and why six of the major sectors noted, civic engagement, economic development, education, government, health, and law enforcement and criminal justice were identified as work group sectors for the race and equity in New Hampshire series. So what impacts our health? This chart from the University of Wisconsin sums up what experts have found and reflects the Bay Area Regional Health Inequities Public Health Framework. The drivers of health are really the sum total of social and economic factors, physical environment factors, clinical care, and health behaviors. These health behaviors are often triggered by those same social, economic, and physical environment factors, which total 50% of the chart. It's what causes us to lose our health in the first place. This is what we need to focus on if we want to impact overall health and wellness. Specifically, physical environment, clinical care, social health behaviors, and social and economic factors. The largest category at 40% is social and economic factors, followed by health behaviors. Note that clinical care, access to health care, is only 20% of the pie chart, and the physical environment makes up 10%. The Race and Equity New Hampshire series has been funded by the Endowment for Health since 2017, with the specific goal of engaging New Hampshire residents in a collective impact undertaking to address race and equity issues in the Granite State. To date, more than 800 people have participated as symposium attendees or volunteer work group members. The first event was an inaugural symposium on race and equity held in October, 2017 and attended by more than 200 people. The inaugural symposium was followed up by a series of action planning phases, phase one, phase two, currently phase three, which have engaged volunteer work group members from across the state to join one of six sector work groups. Each work group is looking to examine and develop action plans to address race and equity issues in New Hampshire in the six sectors I mentioned previously, civic engagement, economic development, education, government, health, and law enforcement criminal justice. The first action planning phase from 2018 to 2019 was followed by Symposium 2.0 on race and equity in New Hampshire on April 29, 2019. Two videos highlighting both the first and second symposia are available on the Endowment for Health website under the health equity section. I strongly encourage each of you to check out these videos which provide a deep dive into the series work and objectives. Here's a graphic that shows the structure of the series, the strategic structure, including the 23 member advisory group created in May of 2020, the six work groups as larger bubbles to the right, the two co-facilitators for each of the six work groups identified by small aqua bubbles, and a future backbone organization, which is yet to be identified. The medium-sized bubbles within the cloud background represent the general public and community partners collaborating with volunteer work group members. 
Today, most work groups have identified action steps and many will begin implementing these steps in the coming months as part of their phase three taking action 2020-2021 activities. The Race and Equity New Hampshire series has three main goals, to build relationships so we can partner together effectively, to create a shared understanding of current social, economic, and political conditions impacting race and equity in New Hampshire, and to identify shared work for an inclusive and equitable New Hampshire. We also use these three guiding questions. One, how can our institutions and organizations create relationships built on trust and an ability to see the effects of systemic racism? What more do we need to know about systemic racism to have an impact on ending it? And three, how might we work together to move the needle in New Hampshire so that as we diversify, we also unify around fairness and equity? A lot has changed in our state since the October 2017 inaugural symposium on race and equity in New Hampshire. At that time, we didn't know if the New Hampshire public would be interested or ready to attend a statewide symposium focusing on race and equity. We were pleasantly surprised by the overwhelming response and desire of residents to participate as volunteer work group members. Since that time, participation has continued to increase. The global pandemic has not restricted this work as it has all moved to a virtual platform. The disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on communities of color and the racial reckoning since the murder of George Floyd has resulted in a greater awareness nationally and statewide of race and equity issues. Besides the Race and Equity in New Hampshire series, there is also much happening today in our state around race and equity. This is just a sampling of some of the organizations and activities underway currently. I'd like to especially highlight the New Hampshire Workplace Racial Equity Learning Challenge, currently underway, which has engaged more than 700 registrants. Registrant. February 2020, Business New Hampshire Magazine, whose cover article focused on racial inequity in healthcare. There is much that you as community members in New Hampshire can become engaged in. If you're interested in this work of addressing issues related to race and equity and intersectionality, and what we'd like to work towards creating an equitable landscape for all, consider these four recommendations for how to proceed on an individual level. Leverage your privilege Ask your business, institution, or organization about your health equity plan and internal processes to diversify leadership. Two, be aware of who is in places of leadership or influence. Do they reflect diversity of race, age, culture, gender, etc.? Three, in medicine, the frame of reference in research and in schooling was often white men. How does that frame information or even opinions of non-majority team members? Oftentimes people of color or other historically excluded groups are not affirmed when bringing up ideas or sharing grievances. This can lead to differences in treatment when compounded within health systems. And four, when you see inappropriate treatments or hear comments, call it out. The work of equity is not the sole burden of those who are not the same. Finally, in closing, I'd like to share with all of you the following Google, Google Doodle that surprised and pleased me when it appeared last week, Thursday, February 18th, honoring Audre Lorde's 87th birthday. Audre Lorde was an American writer, feminist, librarian, and civil rights activist. She was, self she was a self-described, quote, black lesbian mother warrior poet, end quote, who dedicated both her life and her creative talents to confronting and addressing injustices of racism, sexism, classism, capitalism, heterosexism, and homophobia. She lived a life that addressed intersectionality before Kimberly Crenshaw combined the term in 1989. And here's the Google Doodle. It started with this. The second one, there is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not lead single issue lives. What we must do is commit ourselves to some future that can include each other. Our struggles are particular, but we are not alone. And to walk toward that future with the particular strengths of our individual identities. Thank you. And questions, I will stop sharing. Thank you, Melina, that was, um, that was excellent. 
<laughs> Thank you very much. Um, we do have a couple of questions that are um, coming through and starting to come through now. Um, so uh, one right off the bat and to follow up on what you were just speaking on actually uh, was, um, could you please give an example of a scenario uh, of something that needs to be called out or um, in, in, in your opinion, what some of the best ways to go about doing that calling out to, you know, um, whether you speak at the, at the moment or to uh, an authority or, or something like that? That's a really great question. And there isn't necessarily, I would say personally, one specific way of doing this, because I think each individual has to think about the situation they're in and who, what the situation is and who's involved in the situation. So, uh, you know, I have heard stories of uh, colleagues uh, who have at the dinner table or at the Thanksgiving table called out a uh, perceived uh, racist comment or a perceived slight. And sadly, it has resulted in a lot of friction in the family. So uh, I think it is important to call things out, but I think it's also important for each individual to ask themselves how they feel the best way to do that is. Sometimes it's pulling a, a person aside and saying, what, what did you mean by that? Because can I, let me tell you how it came across to me. Uh, so I think it is really important to consider how best to uh, share your perspective with someone without putting that other person on the defensive or without, of course, jeopardizing your place uh, in a job or in uh, a community. Uh, it, it's a delicate balance and a delicate thing to do. And I think it, it, each person has to think through very carefully how to quote unquote, call it out. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the question. Excellent. Um, another question that has come across is, um, do you feel that race is not only used to categorize, but to define how each category should behave as well? Well, uh, another good question. And yes, I mean, uh, since the beginning of this country's existence, uh, through all kinds of, uh, of methods, the media, um, music, um, lack of schooling, et cetera, uh, race has been used to define and, and, and uh, limit opportunities for different groups of people. And so um, I hope I'm answering this question correctly. I'm, I'm, I lost a little bit of the train of thought, but, uh, and so definitely the social construct of race has been used to separate and define what people can and cannot do. I think that uh, our country as a whole and even our state, I moved here when I was eight years old, which was a long time ago, <laughs> um, have, have, moved, have moved forward in understanding that um, race should not define any person, any individual, um, and we've moved forward, but there's still a long way to go. I hope I answered that question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um... Okay, uh, another question that I have uh, is, um, what do you feel is government's role in all of this? You mentioned the, um, the COVID equity uh, board and things like that, uh, but do you believe that it is um, government's role to um, mandate equity of a kind, or do you believe that um, it's more their role to simply raise awareness to create cultural uh, change and, and difference? Well, if you look, if you go back to the 10 things everyone should know about race and number eight, which I reflected on and mentioned a number of times, um, it is clear that within this country, um, systemic racism was instituted in policies and practices. Uh, and these policies and practices go very, very deep. And as I also said, they are oftentimes invisible to groups who are not affected by them. And so it is the role of government to examine policies and practices and laws to determine whether they are excluding certain groups uh, due, to, due to various factors, you know, whether that is um, racial, uh, the racial distinctions or ethnic distinctions or ableism, et cetera. Uh, we know that, for instance, the Americans with Disabilities Act uh, instituted the ability for people with various disabilities to access 
transportation, to access restaurants, et cetera. Prior to that act, uh, people with various disabilities had great difficulty accessing um, places, accessing services, et cetera. So there is a role for, for government in all of this, in looking at uh, current policies, practices, laws, procedures, to determine whether there are indeed um, uh, limitations based on certain factors. Excellent, thank you. Um, it sounds like that will go along with then your idea of um, be aware of who's in the room, of, of being aware in that way of who is um, really being affected or who's being sort of overlooked uh, in some of those policies and things like that. That's right, Jordan, and I'd like to say that it is so important, and this was mentioned in, in sort of the, the closing slides about um, having representation and ensuring that there is representation at the table. Uh, so it's not about necessarily because you're going to increase representation, someone has to leave the table. It's about making the table longer and ensuring that there is this representation from different people with different identities so that they can share their lived experience because my lived experience might not necessarily inform me of what others are experiencing. You know, it's only when you hear it from those individuals who have lived certain challenges or experience certain roadblocks that, that others can start to understand what's really, what's really going on. We all have our blinders. We all have our one way of looking and seeing based on our, the, all the different identities we have. And there are places where we just don't see what others are experiencing. So it's important to, to lengthen the table. Yeah. I was gonna say, I, I love that um, analogy, make the table longer. That's, that's excellent, that's perfect. Um, I have a, uh, a bit of a technical question that actually came um, for your first video, the one from uh, California Newsreel. Um, is that something that you could share a link to? Um, that was a, um, uh, we have someone questioning whether they can use that for their own students. Um, to oh, talk absolutely. About. It's, uh, it's online. You can just Google okay. race the power of an illusion and okay. you can find all of the, the videos there. And the Excellent. same thing for the intersectionality videos that I shared. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I have uh, another question then that came through. Um, how have you found mental health and physical health intersect within historically underserved communities? Um, how can we use this information to enhance the equity? Uh, yeah, that's, that, that, that's a really important question right now, especially right now. You know, um, mental health services have so are so important for the health and well-being of an individual and mental health period are so important for the health and well-being of an individual and a population and with COVID-19 and the impacts of COVID-19 the isolation the challenges with health and wellness the challenges with economic um, economic loss in jobs etc uh, you know mental health practitioners have stated that their work has just gone through the roof and they are trying to find out how can they provide, uh, uh, you know, provide services to the increased number of people struggling, whether it's with depression, anxiety, or other kinds of mental health challenges. Um, and it does, of course, mental health does, everything is interconnected, just like you, we saw with the chart. Um, so mental health, uh, me mental health uh, challenges and needs definitely impact you know, physical ability and the ability of people to, to get out and um, exercise or to be able to get out and access care, to be able to find a job, et cetera. So it, it, one is not separate from the other. This is all a piece of that pie that you saw uh, and extremely important. Excellent, yes, thank you. Um, we have, let's see, uh, only another question or two that's come through yet. Don't. Uh, um, Please do send them, keep sending them uh, as we have a little bit more time here uh, as well. Uh, but one question that has come through is um, how would you grade the um, pandemic response overall in terms of its, um, in terms of dealing with intersectionality? Uh, the pandemic response in the state of New Hampshire, the pandemic yes, response in the, U in the US. Uh, sure. um, well, um, I, I think that, um, I think that the governor is to be commended for having um, created the task force and the task force 
took it upon themselves and within a, within a very short time came up with this uh, the report. Uh, and the report highlights a lot of places where improvements need to be made and improvements could be made. Um, I know that this pandemic hit uh, states very hard and, and, and uh, the public health networks and the public health uh, practitioners and the essential workers did everything they could to take care of the, the people of New Hampshire and keep us safe and keep us healthy. Um, I don't know if I am the one to give a grade uh, for the response. Um, I think we could always do better and I think we are working towards that. Um, but uh, I, I believe that uh, our public health networks and, and, and health providers um, did a, a, a mammoth job to keep us as safe as, as they could, given the resources they had um, at the time and, and the, the resources they have now. And of course, we collaborate at the Endowment for Health with lots of people in the broader health community. And I just want to commend them for everything that they have done in addition to the essential workers. Excellent, thank you. Um, the last question that I see currently, for now, for the time being, um, but the last question that I see here also is, um, what are any um, groups or organizations that you can recommend for someone who wants to get more involved in these sorts of things? Oh, well, thank you. That's, a, that's an excellent question. I'm glad you someone posed it. Um, there's so many things you can get involved in. The Race and Equity in New Hampshire series has these phases and all the, 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 the work group members are volunteers. So this phase is already underway. It'll end in July. And then most probably we'll start phase four, which starts, um, which starts up usually in October and runs for about nine months. So, so we would love to have more students participate in this, younger people participate in this. Uh, and so if you're interested in learning about the race and learning more about the race and equity in New Hampshire series, you can um, find information on the endowment website on the health equity page. Um, you can um, you know, email me uh, and I can forward you information. Uh, we're not really, the, the work groups are not really accepting new work group members now since they've been working in phase three since October of 2020, but for the future, definitely. That's number one. Number two, uh, some of the other work that was highlighted in that um, in the slide I showed, the Welcoming New Hampshire work, welcomingnewhampshire.org is a great organization that's looking at um, welcoming work and immigrant integration work in the state. That's another great um, effort afoot. Of course, uh, the health uh, the um, the the health equity challenge that I noted on the slide. You can Google that, and there's ways to get involved in in all of that. Um, and then some of your presenters previously. So Indigenous New Hampshire, that was Denise and Paul Puglio. I had their um, beautiful horizon slide, you know, um, uh, picture on, on the compilation. They're doing amazing work. Tanisha Johnson and uh, Black Lives Matter Seacoast and Black Lives Matter Nashua, uh, in addition to the NAACPs um, in, the, in, the, in the Seacoast, Manchester and Nashua area, area is doing great work. Uh, and there's also work in many other communities. So depending upon what your, your area of interest is and the community you're interested in working with, you know, I strongly encourage the students and others to get online and start Googling uh, and, and, and see what pops up. Uh, but there's, there's a lot going on. And once you start connecting with one group of, uh, of, of folks or one initiative, you often start to learn about others. Mm -hmm. um, excellent, thank you. Um... Yes, yeah, we're, uh, um, we had uh, Denise and Paul and we're hoping to have them again uh, uh, in the near future. Um, so um, another question that did come through, uh, given your global experience, uh, how can we also incorporate a more global perspective to this issue and work uh, towards understanding the experiences of those uh, coming from or those in other countries uh, as it relates to health equity? Yeah, I love that question. I spent um, five years in the Co Democratic Republic of the Congo. I was a public health Peace Corps volunteer for two and a half years. And then I worked in Kinshasa, the capital of the Democratic Republic of Congo, actually helping to create the first Sub-Saharan Graduate School of Public Health uh, on the continent. And um, it was an amazing experience and really enlightened me to the challenges faced um, in the Congo. I had lived in Nigeria as a child and in the Caribbean. So 
I do have sort of a, a, a an international background uh, and have also spent a lot of time in New Hampshire. I think it is extremely important to see what's going on around the world in terms of health equity, to try to connect with organizations and with online, you can find so much that's going on and try to learn from how other countries and other efforts have addressed, addressed issues of health equity. One of the recommendations in the governor's task force uh, response team's report was the use of community health workers and the compensation of community health workers to reach uh, disproportionately impacted communities. This is not a new idea. This idea goes way back to the barefoot doctors in China, you know, in, in, in the early part of the century. And, and then community health workers, I train community health workers in villages in the Congo. So a lot of these ideas are coming back. We can learn a lot from what other countries are doing around the world and share our knowledge. So um, I definitely think there's a lot to be learned and a lot to be shared by, by connecting with other efforts uh, on our planet. I was, um, I actually had a, a question I was wondering about, and I was listening to someone talk about the, um, the Oxford vaccine, um, which then became the AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, and there was, if I remember correctly, there was originally a, a talk of making the vaccine open source uh, and therefore making it available for um, producers to, to create, um, you know, wherever they basically had the means to do so um, without sort of proprietary, um, ownership of it. Uh, and I was wondering um, how you feel or if you can make any comments on um, on the uh, vaccine distribution or, um, you know, whether those kinds of ideas that were being floated, you know, um, or just the, the idea that the vaccines are, are being given out for free at this point, um, or more or less for free, um, whether that's, uh, you know, steps in the right direction or whether those are impractical or, you know, any of that kind of stuff, any of your comments basically on the um, vaccine rollout uh, in that way. Yeah, well, it's a great question, but I, you know, I don't feel that I'm adequately informed to okay. talk about um, the best methods for the vaccine rollout as it relates to sort of other countries and 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 what you mentioned Jordan um, mm -hmm. I I think that I guess I would say without being sort of someone who's really deeply involved in the vaccine rollout process um, uh, I would say that I am always open to seeing what is possible um, but then you have to so so I think it's important to be open to the possibility of trying new you methods to get the vaccine to various populations, both uh, domestically and internationally, especially the most isolated populations or hard to serve po hard populations that have difficulty accessing services. Um, at the same time, it's important to consider what, what might be unintended consequences of these new methods. So I, that's why I hesitate to say what's good and what's bad because I really don't have enough knowledge about it. But I guess my point is that looking at various unique approaches is a good thing if we can at the same time uh, deeply consider what the implications might be for these approaches and how these approaches might cause some potential unintended consequences and not have the outcomes that we hope they they would have sure no I that's I a... that question a bit but I, I just don't feel I have enough information to be able to really say definitively one way or the other what 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 is best and what isn't? No, but actually, I mean that uh, you know to some degree. Uh, what I was hoping was to hear what your um, um, the nuance within that question that usually gets a you know hooray open source or boo open source or something like that, and that's sort of the only two options or basically you know there. The, um, and so to have your uh, to have your take on it um, in a more nuanced way into um, in that uh, you know really the the potential uh, pitfalls and things like that. Thank you, uh, I think that was actually um, useful. Uh, that was actually helpful. Um, yes, uh, I think that's actually, <laughs> unfortunately in that way, uh, that might be the last question that I have listed here. Don't mind. Um,
Yes, that's actually, uh, unless there are any others, but, um, and we are at uh, a little bit over time here, um, or at least the originally scheduled time, but I do thank you for, for staying with us and for asking or for answering our questions um, and for um, more importantly, just for, for delivering this very important talk and opening up some of these uh, ideas uh, to us, some of these uh, concepts um, that, uh, that are crucial, critical, uh, especially uh, at an educational institution and, and for our, our students. But I would say uh, thank you very much. Um, and I'm seeing here that yes, that, that does appear to have been um, the last uh, question. So I, I, I suppose my last question to you is, um, do you have a closing thought or, or uh, you know, a, a bullet point or something like that that you really, um, that, that you'd prefer to share with us uh, in closing? Well, I, I would like to, I would like to simply commend Great Bay Community College for this um, community, these colloquiums, because I think it's, it's wonderful. Thank you to the students and others who are on this call and, and, and listened in, because I think it is, it is wonderful to open up uh, the, um, the op to, to provide the opportunity for uh, professionals of color to speak to the students, to share their experiences, to share their knowledge. Uh, and so, first of all, kudos to Great Bay Community College uh, for this. And the fact that these presentations are, most of those that were able to be uh, filmed, uh, videotaped, are on your website so that students and others can go back and see them. I actually went back and watched some of them myself, which informed me. Um, so I think that's what I'd like to say in closing. Thank you to all of you for this opportunity. Uh, for for the conversations that you're you're having and reaching out to to various people in New Hampshire to share a little bit about their their work and 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 their interests uh, and for the students um, you know keep being keep being informed and keep reaching out and uh, you know we were all students once and some some of us are students now still again so um, I think it's I think it's terrific and uh, I thank all of you for allowing me to spend some time with you today. Well, we appreciate that you do. Um, thank you very much. And I think that is a, a wonderful way to close. So um, thank you very much. Uh, and and um, we hope to, to, to hear from you again in the future sometime, uh, perhaps. Um, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks to all of you. Take good care, be safe and be well. Thank you, you too. Have a good one.